Before Moses Malone became the first high school basketball player to jump straight into the pros, he had to deal with a lot of turmoil in his parents' relationship. But in the midst of this troubled relationship, Moses' mother would make one decision that would change his life forever. And that's what we're trying to figure out with this video. I'm Jesse with Basketball Dive, and this is the story of Moses Malone's family. In the historical town of Petersburg, Virginia, there lived two struggling people. A man whose name is not known, who was a chronic drunk, and a woman named Mary Malone, who did odd jobs after dropping out of school just before entering the fifth grade. Mary Elizabeth Hudgens, reportedly born on July 20th, 1928, was from Chesterfield County. She was the first child of nine children and couldn't make it out of grade school because she had to support her family by working. She would eventually marry and give birth to Moses Malone, but she couldn't endure the marriage for long. She had to drive her husband out of the house because of his excessive drinking. And while Mary stayed back in Petersburg to raise Moses alone, the man reportedly moved to Texas only to show up later in dramatic fashion. Moses was just two years old when his dad left, and from that time till he went to play pro basketball, it was just him and his mother against the world. You know, I can look back at my, my childhood with just me and my mother. She raised Moses in the ways of Christianity, a religion her son held on to till his death. When he was growing up, Moses would place a note of what he wanted to achieve inside a Bible, and then would go on to work to achieve it. For example, he put in the Bible that he would be the first to make it to pro basketball from high school. Before that, he also placed in the Bible that by the end of his junior year, he would be regarded as the best high school player. And guess what? Everything we just talked about came to pass. This was how Mary raised her son, in faith and hard work. She also supported his basketball dreams, knowing how much he loved hooping. He always loves his basketball, and that's what gives that boy his courage, Mary once said. She also did the best she could to provide for him, saying that she didn't want him to suffer the way that she had growing up. But things weren't particularly easy for her. They lived in a small house on 241 St. Matthew Street in Petersburg, and things were financially rough for them, with Mary earning around $100 a week as a packer at the local Safeway grocery store. The plumbing faltered most days, and poverty could be registered from the obvious lack around the home. You could find portraits of Jesus Christ, Martin Luther King Jr., and President Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy on the walls, and the only book they had was an old Bible, which, ironically, was given to Mary by her husband. But that was about it for Mary and her son Teeny, whom she liked to call Moses. And oh, instead of a window, there was a huge hole in the wall. This is one of the reasons why Moses didn't bother to go to college and went straight to play professional basketball so that he could help out his mom. Not to mention that, college recruiters who were coming around to try to recruit him were giving him and his mother a very hard time. But with the help of his friends, he developed a means of avoiding the endless visits from recruiters. While he wasn't hiding away from the house, his friends would knock a certain way on his family door just to signal to him that a recruiter was around, and when he got the signal, he would either hide somewhere or escape the house through that huge hole, then climb past the roof and make a run for it. His mother would then have to deal with the recruiters. Some of the recruiters were going as far as sleeping on the porch of their old shack. A certain assistant coach at the University of New Mexico, John Wisenant, spent 61 days in Petersburg trying his hardest to get to Malone. Well, at least Wisenant didn't do something crazy like one recruiter from Oral Roberts University. The recruiter, who was also named Oral Roberts, was the president and the evangelical faith healer of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He went to see Mary Malone one day about recruiting his son, but when he got there, he discovered that Mary was sick with an ulcer. So guess what Roberts did next? He told Mary that he would heal her only if she asked her son to play for his university. This was how crazy it was for the Malone family at the time. But running away from people who were drawn by his talent and the benefits that came with it didn't stop with the recruiters. Moses Malone also never talked to the press because, as he said during his Hall of Fame speech, he wanted to keep his concentration whenever he played. People always said, Moses, you know, you'd never talk to the press because uh, I always like to have my concentration when I'm about to play. But you see, the truth is, Moses has never really been a big talker himself. As a kid in school, he was very shy because of his bad teeth and intimidating height. He was also nicknamed Jughead because of the size of his head and was picked on a lot for that. 
He was considered dumb and someone who couldn't articulate properly, but his teachers and coaches who really knew him knew it was a matter of personality and desire. Coach of Maryland University Lefty Drizel confirmed this when he said, It was a matter of goals. I firmly believe that if Mo had put it in his Bible to be a B student, then he would have become one. And speaking of the Bible, even though Moses had already desired to go pro straight out of high school, he still considered going to college. And amidst the hundreds of colleges that wanted him, it was Maryland he truly considered. He even went as far as signing their letter of intent and would have probably gone all the way to college. Nevertheless, he would stick to his initial goal and sign with the Utah Stars in the American Basketball Association, or ABA, in 1974 at the young age of 18, becoming the first high schooler to go pro. After getting his first pay from the signing bonus given to him by the Utah Stars, he bought his mom a house, a ranch in Etick, Virginia. But Mary still went back to their old shack sometimes just to see how far they had come from their poverty. Moses never felt the absence of a father because of some of the men around him. A certain assistant coach at Petersburg High, Pro Hayes, acted not just as a coach or counselor, but also as a father figure for Moses Malone. Hayes provided probably the best summation about Malone's young life when he said, quote, Moses was always very independent, very proud, never asked for money, and lord, he could use it. Never brag either. His mother did a wonderful job with him, but I've known a lot of kids like Moses, and a good mother sacrificing is not necessarily enough. It's tough. These kinds of kids get depressed. No matter what they might tell you, they want a mother and a father. Both. So much. That kind of kid can go either way. There's no in-between. Moses became strong, independent. He likes to do his job and go off by himself, just be alone and play his music. And people misunderstood. They would decide he was ignorant or arrogant, but they were wrong. When he started to consider the pros, I was concerned for him. I was afraid that if he was defeated then, he could be destroyed. And so much more has happened than we ever feared. His team folding, then the league, being traded all around, so much. And he's still Moses. The same Moses. He's not Billy Showboat, no sir. You see, Moses had a lot more faith in himself than we did." End quote. Other men that provided fatherly support were Lee Fentress and Donald Dell, who were his agent and lawyers, respectively. Donald Dell is an American lawyer, writer, and commentator, and a former tennis player. He is popular for being one of the fathers of marketing in sports and was notable for representing tennis stars such as Jimmy Connors and Arthur Ashe. He was even involved with Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing at some point and co-founded the Association of Tennis Professionals, or ATP. So, in a nutshell, Dell has seen it all and done it all, but he was remembered by Malone as a friend first, advisor second, and, of course, a father figure. Dell recalls what they had to go through before they signed the contract to play for the Utah Stars. He commended Moses for being wise and for not rushing the whole process, even though he had already written in their family bible that he wanted to become a pro from high school. But he also wanted the best offer, the best money. So he called Dell multiple times to ask for advice. 18 calls. 18. Every time Utah made a new move, Moses called me. I knew then that he was a hell of a lot smarter than he was given credit for," Dell said. Lee and Dell were also the ones that advised Moses to help get legal support for his mother to divorce his father. This is because his father started to make sudden visits to the Malones when their son started getting paid big time. Imagine that. Nevertheless, Fentress would remain Malone's agent all throughout his career, and they would grow very close, becoming like a father and son. During his Hall of Fame speech, Malone appreciated Lee for sticking with him all those years like a father would. You know, this man had been like a father to me. I've been with him for 28 years. A lot of people unfairly classified Moses Malone as a dimwit, and as we've covered, that just really wasn't true. He navigated his life with a lot of faith in his heart, and a lot of that was also due to his mother's love helping him navigate his life. And despite him having that reputation of being a dimwit, he also had logic behind him. He used lawyers and agents to help him find his way in the NBA. Some of these lawyers and agents would basically be like fathers to Moses. But as far as being a father goes, what did Moses do that was different from his own dad? How how did he fare as a father? We'll go over that right now. You know how Moses Malone likes to keep his private life private? 
Well, with that said, it's hard to tell how he did with the ladies, but in any case, Malone was married to Alfreda Gill for 10 years, and when their union hit the spotlight, it was not for good reasons. In 1992, Alfreda was granted a divorce by the courthouse at Fort Bend County after 10 years of marriage to Malone. Alfreda had initially filed for a restraining order against her husband during the divorce proceedings. She had cited abuse and infidelity as her rationale for initiating the divorce. Her attorney, Judy Persborski, provided a shocking remark about the case. Quote, It's primarily because there has been history of physical abuse and he has threatened to kill her on many occasions. He told her he would cut her up and douse her in gasoline and set her on fire if it would stop her from going through with the divorce." End quote. But Moses had pleaded not guilty to physically abusing her, stating, I never touched my wife. The problem was that I am in the limelight and things like this are going to happen. In addition, during the case, Alfreda asked for $12,500 every month for child support for their two children they had together, Moses Malone Jr. and Michael Earl Malone. But things were about to get even uglier. In January 1993, following their divorce, Moses was arrested in Texas, but later released. His crime? Well, a couple of things according to his wife. She accused him of stalking her and generally disturbing her and their sons in her home in League City, Texas. She also said that Moses had broken into her home, destroyed her property, and threatened to murder her. Whether or not this was true cannot be verified for certain, but Alfreda later sought a peace bond from the court that would prevent Moses from harassing her. Moses would later find love again in 2006 when he met Leah Nash. They were never married but had a son, Micah Francois Malone. They dated until Moses died on September 13, 2015 from a heart condition. He was 60 years old and survived by three sons. Moses Malone Jr. was born on December 1, 1979 in Clear Lake, Texas. Like his father, he chose the path of basketball, but he wasn't really successful in the game as his father was. After finishing at South Carolina State, he was eligible for the 03 NBA draft, but eventually went undrafted. The next time that we would hear from him again was when he got into the news with James Harden, but it was not good news at all. Malone Jr. had filed a lawsuit against Harden after a club bouncer, Darian Blunt, robbed and beat him. I know that sentence doesn't make much sense, but hear me out. You see, in 2016, Malone Jr. criticized James Harden on his Facebook page for charging $249 from children who wanted to be part of his basketball camp. Then, a few months later, Malone was robbed of his $50,000 jewelry and beaten outside the club by Darian Blunt and some other men. Malone accused Harden of paying Blunt $20,000 to punish him for his criticism, but Harden's lawyers denied the accusations, stating that Malone was just looking to exploit the NBA star financially. In any case, Blunt would be serving 35 years in prison for aggravated assault and robbery, and as you know, Harden wasn't charged with anything. If not, you wouldn't have seen him get knocked out with Philly in the 2023 playoffs. Sorry, Sixers fans. Anyway, as for Malone's second son, he chose a different type of sport. Michael Earl Malone was born on September 3, 1984. He had played football, and his father once joked during his Hall of Fame enshrinement speech that he had wished Michael picked basketball instead because there was more money in playing basketball, in his opinion. Michael Malone, he loved football for some reason. I'm trying to tell him, man, the money in basketball. <laughs> Michael had played high school football in Friendswood, Texas, and was regarded as a wide receiver with some promise. He played college football for Virginia Tech, but later transferred to Sam Houston State, where he was their third leading receiver at some point in 05. But where Malone's first sons didn't become famous athletes, there's a chance that his last son, Micah, might just go all the way. He's still just a kid, so not much is known about him yet. Nevertheless, there are some clips of him already, where he is playing basketball and looking like a potential star. So while Micah Malone tries to develop himself into the next basketball superstar, why not watch this video showing right here about another basketball legend who had kids of his own that tried to follow in his footsteps. The only difference is this guy had multiple children with at least 10 different women. Trust me, his family story is as crazy as you think it is. Take care.